Hello everyone, welcome to this lunchtime session on power of attorney. We're delighted that we've had over 800 people registered for this lunchtime webinar session today. We have with us Nigel, who is the British Sign Language Interpreter. Nigel, there is a comment in the chat box for you um, in the Q&A section that you, you have to join um, the presenter link. So if you could do that, then it means we can all see you on the screen um, and you, you'll be visible to all of our attendees. Hope you picked that up OK, Nigel. And we'll just get started. So we will be mindful um, during this session that we'll build some pauses and that will allow Nigel to be able to um, to, to share with us um, as he um, does the, the sign language through the, the session. Hopefully Nigel is just joining us. So the latest data from Public Health Scotland shows that around 375 people are currently delayed in hospital due to adults with incapacity issues, which includes not having a power of attorney. This number has doubled over the last two years. Hence, we've arranged this session to help increase practitioner knowledge in order to improve earlier uptake of this essential element of future planning. Before I pass to our speakers, my colleague Julie Miller is going to give some housekeeping on how this session will run today. So over to you, Julie, and I'll move the, the slides on. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, just a bit of housekeeping information about how Microsoft Teams Live works and what that means for you today. So on to the next slide, Michelle. The format's a bit different from, from regular Microsoft Teams in that with live, the audience can't use cameras or microphones. Only presenters can do this. So the audience can't be seen or heard and can't interact with other attendees. But you can upvote by liking any questions you see in the Q&A that you particularly like to see put to speakers. We've got I think over we've got 800 people registered to attend, so um, I would think the Q&A is going to be really busy. So um, the Q&A section is after the speakers, so get your questions in as we go, because questions are moderated. They can take about a minute <clears throat> to appear in the live chat, and I'll explain a bit more about the Q&A in a second. The session will be recorded, and by taking part, you can send to this, and the recording of the session will be made available soon afterwards. So fingers crossed we won't have any technical problems and hopefully Nigel can join us. But if we do bear with bear with us and the Microsoft Teams Live guys will try and resolve these quickly. So the next slide, thanks. So the Q&A. So if you look at the top right of your screen, it's the speech bubble with a question mark in it. And when you click that, it brings up the Q&A panel, which is on the next slide. Onto the next slide, thank you. So submit your questions using the text box shown and they'll show up in the My Questions tab. And once they're approved, they'll show up in the Featured panel. And on the next slide, you'll, you'll see, oh sorry, it's the one before Michelle, sorry, I'm skipping that. Um, but you'll see that you can like your favourite questions by giving them a thumbs up and that will help to bring them to the moderator's attention. Now, the moderator today are Lynn and myself. So if you're asking a question of a specific speaker, it will help us greatly if you can add your name to the question so that we pose it to the right, the right person. So I hope that's all clear. Thank you. And back to you, Michelle. Thanks very much, Julie. And this is what the agenda is looking like today. In addition to our key speakers, um, Jill and Jim, um, we have a, a Q&A panel where we'll be picking up on all of the questions that you put in the Q&A chat box, as Julie has just described. 
and I'm delighted that Dr Vivek Patton, um, consultant psychiatrist and our clinical lead um, for psychiatry within Healthcare Improvement Scotland is also joining us for, for um, the Q&A panel and can pick up on some of the clinical questions that are um, appearing on the Q&A um, as well. And then we'll we'll have some further resources to share through through the session, and then we'll close with some closing remarks. So I'll now um, hand over to our next speaker, and our first speaker is um, Jill Carson, who is public policy consultant with Alzheimer Scotland. We're so grateful to you, Jill, um, for, for doing this session today. We know it's been a, a huge amount of work for you and thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing the considerable knowledge and experience you have of Power of Attorney and the campaign that, that has run alongside this. So I'll hand over to you. I'll stop um, controlling my slides and hand over to you so you should have um, your slides. Thank you very much for that, Michelle. Uh, we've just got a slight technical hitch here, I think. Uh, let me see if I can now get control of the slides. There we are. OK, that's great. Thank you. So thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to talk to you about hopefully everything you always wanted to know about power of attorney and maybe a bit more besides. So let's see how this goes. So. Bear with me while we get the slide to move on. There we are. OK, thank you. So let's start with why power of attorney is important. Well, it's to do with your human rights. Where there is an issue that needs a decision that is linked to your human rights, then no one has the power to consent for you. So if you're in a position where you're not able to consent for yourself, then legislation kicks in, the law kicks in. The legislation in Scotland is the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act of 2000. And that's what sets out how power of attorney operates today. Now, what that legislation says is that where you have to make a decision that impacts on your rights, there is no decision to be made without legal authority. And there are a number of ways that that legal authority can be given. The first and foremost of these is power of attorney. The power of attorney is a proactive measure. It's proactive because you decide in advance that you're going to take this step to protect your rights. It's voluntary. You decide that you're going to do it. No one else can do it for you. Uh, or at least they can only act on your instructions, but it has to be your instructions and nobody else's. Guardianship is another way of giving legal authority to make decisions. And if someone doesn't have an attorney in place and a decision has to be made, then often it's guardianship that has to be applied for. Now, guardianship is retrospective. So in other words, it's done after the event. So guardianship is only applied for when someone has already lost capacity. So it's involuntary. It isn't a decision that's made by the person concerned. It's made after the event. Um, so power of attorney is in advance and guardianship is not. There is also medical decision making which can happen without, if you like, legal authority. And medical decision making can be done in an emergency setting. So if the responsible medical officer for your care has to respond to a medical emergency for you, then that responsible medical officer can decide how best to treat you, even if you're not able to consent. So in an emergency, treatment can be offered. And medical decision making can also happen under a Section 47 certificate. And that's a certificate under the Adults with Incapacity Act, which allows the responsible medical officer to set out what your health care needs are and what treatment you require to meet those needs. And that gives the authority to treat. Now, your next of kin has no rights in that regard, can be consulted, certainly, but has no right to make any decisions on your behalf, unless, of course, you have already 
appointed your next of kin to be your attorney. So important decisions that tend to be covered under power of attorney are financial issues as well as welfare issues, things that impact on your ability to manage and control your life and to be in control of your rights. So if you don't have a power of attorney appointed to meet your financial needs, then things like managing money, including bills and contracts, becomes an issue as well as decisions around about your health and well-being. A power of attorney is also important in the context of human rights more generally, and there are particular pieces of uh, policy that refer to this, the European Convention on Human Rights, to which we are signed up, and the UN, UN Convention, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which is also something that is in that international sphere and something that nations are expected to pay attention to. It's not actually incorporated into law in this country at this point in time, but that is an aspiration. So why is power of attorney a problem in a healthcare context specifically? Well, Michelle has already laid the groundwork for this with those statistics on the challenge we have with people who are delayed in hospital because they cannot be discharged. And the reason people who fall under the Adults with Incapacity Act, in other words, who are judged to lack capacity, uh, the reason there is an issue for discharge of people who fall into that uh, category is because they don't have an attorney appointed and therefore there is no one appointed legally to take those decisions. And in order to make a decision that impacts on your human rights, like where you should live, it needs to have legal authority. If you have not proactively put an attorney in place, then it has to be done retrospectively through the courts. Now, we've been looking at this in Glasgow since uh, 2012, when it was recognised that there was an issue with getting people out of hospital. Now, back in 2012, it was much more of a hidden problem. It was hidden because we actually did not contribute statistics on delayed discharges from our mental health side. And it was also hidden because although in general hospitals, the information was collected and collated on people who were unable to be discharged because they lacked capacity, they weren't published statistics. So it was a pretty hidden problem. So we decided in Glasgow to take a closer look at it. And this is what we found in 2012. That's a long time ago and it's interesting, well, sobering perhaps to hear the statistics that Michelle gave at the beginning there. So at that time, we found there were 157 people in our Glasgow beds who could not be discharged because they lacked capacity and no one had the legal authority to effect the discharge. And that equated to 70 unavailable beds. It equated to, therefore, about three wards, five and a half million pounds and 25,000 lost bed days. In other words, 25,000 days where there was somebody in a hospital bed who didn't need treatment, who didn't need to be there. And not only that, of course, that means that someone who perhaps did need to be there couldn't be admitted. So we decided in Glasgow to run a conference to look more closely at the issues. And we titled that conference, Why Am I Still Here? Because we wanted the emphasis very much to be on the person, the person at the centre of it. So we looked at the role of all the different professionals and organisations who have an impact in this area. The responsible medical officer, who may well be the, the person who's doing that assessment of capacity in the first place to determine that someone does not have the capacity to consent to a discharge from hospital into an area where their uh, liberty might be deprived, like a care home, and therefore it's impacting on their human rights. Uh, so we looked more closely at what the Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act says, and we also looked at Section 13ZA of the Social Work Scotland Act, which is, believe it or not, 1968, which is a very long time ago. 
But it's important because what Section 13 ZA says is that where there is no legal authority to allow someone to be discharged from hospital, but the person does not object to the move and the key people, that being the multidisciplinary team, the relatives, the close people involved, if nobody objects, then what Section 13 ZA says is that the discharge can go ahead even where there isn't that legally appointed representative to make the decision. We're going to come back to that a bit later in the presentation. We looked at the role of the chief social worker, which essentially is, is to step in, particularly where uh, there is no one else to take on that decision making role. The role of lawyers, which again becomes particularly important where you have to go to court, but lawyers are also the gateway to getting some support in terms of power of attorney. But most of all, we look to see, well, how does it feel? How does it feel when you are the person in that hospital bed? What is the impact? Well, you have someone who's living in a hospital when they don't require treatment. And just a pause to think about that for a second. Living in a hospital when you don't require treatment. I don't think that's something that any of us would really want. It cuts across your right to family life and it puts you in a position where it's the courts that are deciding what happens to you. And our own Human Rights Act in the UK, Article 5 says, everyone has the right to liberty and security of person. So it's a bit frustrating, isn't it, that this legislation, Adults with Incapacity Act, which is designed to protect us and all of the human rights legislation and policy is designed to protect us and yet, you can end up in this situation stuck in hospital where you actually don't have your liberty, you don't have security and you don't have your rights respected. So it's a bit of a challenge there. So let's take a closer look at what happens if you do have power of attorney, if you have put your power of attorney in place. So you have to look and see what powers are covered, but if you have put in the power of attorney document these powers, then what you are doing is giving the power to somebody else, someone of your choosing, to decide, for example, what medication you might take, what treatment you should have, to decide who you should see or not see, decide who could have details of your condition, and decide, importantly, where you should live. If you haven't given any of these powers in your power of attorney document, then your attorney can't act. It's only if they are stated. So that's why it's very important to get your power of attorney document right and to make sure it covers what you want it to cover. But the critical thing about your attorney is your attorney has to act as if it was you making the decision. So your attorney can't say, well, OK, my spouse really wanted this, but I don't agree, so I'm going to do that. You have, as the attorney, to act in accordance with the wishes of the person, as if it was the person making the decision. If you don't have power of attorney, no one can consent on your behalf. There is no legal authority for welfare decisions. Medical treatment as we said earlier, is covered under the Adults with Incapacity Act through that certificate and the responsible medical officer will be deciding that treatment and will be consulting with relevant others, including family members, multidisciplinary team. But where legal authority is required for your rights, for example, admit, admission to a care home where you are going to be deprived of your liberty because you won't be free to leave once you go there, then that discharge from hospital to care home cannot happen um, without applying to the courts for authorisation. And that would generally be for the appointment of a guardian. So if we take a look at the responsibilities of an attorney, because some of this information I think is really helpful when you're trying to think through what it means to be an attorney and what happens if you don't have an attorney. So what an attorney 
is required to do is, as we've said, to act within the powers stated. Now, power of attorney can cover financial aspects, it can cover welfare aspects, or it can cover both. And just as an aside, there is a difference between the way that those two sets of powers operate. If you give someone financial powers, you can actually choose to do that at any time of your choosing. So even where you have capacity to consent to make your own decisions, you can decide to have someone else to act for you in terms of financial decisions. However, welfare decisions can only be enacted at a point in time when you have lost capacity. So whilst you have the capacity to make your own decisions around about your health and well-being, no one else can take over that consent at all. And within your power of attorney document, you should have a statement saying how you want your capacity or your lack of capacity to be determined. Your attorney needs to follow the principles of the Act, and that means need to provide a decision which has the most benefit and be least restrictive to you. But importantly, ha has, as we said, to act as if following your will and your preferences and acting in accordance with your human rights. If your attorney has in their possession an advanced statement of any kind where you have set out what your wishes, your will and your preferences are, then that's really, really helpful. It's helpful to, for your attorney to not be trying to second guess what you might have wanted in that situation. Sometimes attorneys can be very clear and sometimes less clear, depending on the decision. Um, but it also means that it's less open to challenge. So if you as an individual have made perhaps a very difficult decision that you're wanting to refuse treatment in the event, for example, if you're unable to take food or drink without um, having supplemental feeding through, say, a nasogastric tube, and if you've said, I don't want treatment by that, then that decision might be challengeable by medics who might say, well, are you sure? Not, not sure about this. So if you have set your wishes down in advance, that's helpful and that helps your attorney to follow those wishes. If there are joint attorneys, because you can appoint uh, as your choice more than one attorney, but if you've appointed more than one attorney to act jointly, then your attorneys have to agree on the, the, the course of action. The responsibilities of a guardian. Well, like an attorney, a guardian has to follow the principles of the Act, has to act as if, has to follow your will and your preferences and act in accordance with your rights. But a guardian is also formally accountable to the public guardian. Now, attorneys have to act in good faith uh, along the lines laid out in the Outside Incapacity Act too. But a, public, a guardian is formally accountable to the public guardian and has to produce an inventory, a management plan and annual accounts. That sounds pretty scary. It's not something that people would undertake lightly. So however challenging it sounds to take on the responsibilities of an attorney, because it is challenging, but it's something that you can commit to do on behalf of someone that's close to you, for example. But a guardian is, if you like, an, another step further in terms of what you have to do. It's pretty scary. But if you need a guardian, so if you haven't put your power of attorney in place and a guardian is required to have that authority to make decisions on your behalf and no one close to you or in a, a reasonably close position or with an interest is willing or able to take on the role, then the chief social worker has to take on that role. And that's something that tends to scare people. Uh, if you talk to members of the public and say, do you know, if you don't take proactive action, then this is a situation you could end up in with the social worker deciding what happens to you. That can sound a little bit scary to people. So I want to look a little bit more at the legislation and policy background, because I think it's important to understand why we are where we are in terms of 
the situation that we find ourselves in health and social care. The Adults with Incapacity Scotland Act is what sets it out in Scotland and it is worth just revisiting the notion which we all know that capacity is decision specific. We all know that and yet it is so easy, we all do it, we slip into the language of talking about people who lack capacity as if it was all or nothing. And of course it isn't as simple as that. People can often make decisions about one thing or another thing and yet be unable to make decisions about some other things. So it's very decision specific. So your capacity should always be assessed with the particular decision to be made in mind. And if you do lack the capacity to make a decision, then as we've said in the legislation, that decision has to be made by a legally appointed representative and be the most benefit and least restrictive choice. The European Convention on Human Rights in Article 5 says that no one shall be deprived of his liberty. Now, it's not what's called an absolute right because actually there are some situations in which you can be deprived of your liberty. For example, if you're sent to jail, um, you will be deprived of your liberty. But in general, no one can be deprived of their liberty without proper authority and without going through due process. Now, in Scotland and in the UK, we are signed up to the Euro European Convention on Human Rights, so we need to respect that. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in Article 12 says measures relating to the exercise of legal capacity have to respect the rights, the will and the preferences of the person. They have to be free of conflict of interest and undue influence, they have to be proportional and they have to be tailored to the person's circumstances. They should apply for the shortest time possible and be subject to regular review. So all of this needs to be contained within our Adults with Incapacity Act or ideally should be. Now, as I said, UNCRPD is not actually in our legislation at the moment but it is considered internationally. That's what nation states should be aspiring to. And it is certainly what Scotland and indeed the UK aspires to. Article 14 also says the existence of a disability shall in no case justify a deprivation of liberty. So in other words, you cannot say, ah, yes, but Mr X needs treatment for this condition or that condition because he has a disability and therefore he needs to be kept in hospital. The existence of a disability doesn't justify deprivation of liberty. So we're going to look a bit more closely at a couple of key legal decisions in this kind of area. Bear with me with this. If you're interested, I would recommend that you go and read up uh, the much, there's lots of information online about Bournewood and about Cheshire West that I'm going to come to in a moment. Um, and it's really interesting stuff and it's really complex stuff, deprivation of liberty, which is what we're talking about when we have adults stuck in hospital unable to be discharged, is, is a big issue, but it's a complex issue. Bournewood in 2004 was a case of a gentleman who was living in a hospital. He had profound disabilities, complex disabilities, and he wasn't free to leave the hospital, nor did he particularly show desire to leave the hospital, but sometimes his treatment required um, his, his carers to manage behaviour. The gentleman in this case was considered to be detained because he wasn't in fact free to leave. He was de facto detained, whether that was meeting his needs or not. Is being detained the same as a deprivation of liberty in this case? And this, all I want you to take from this is that it's not straightforward because the High Court said, no, gentleman is not deprived of his liberty. The Court of Appeal said, yes, he is. The House of Lords said, no, he's not. And ultimately, the ultimate arbiter, the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, it is deprivation of liberty. And they said that because the healthcare professionals treating 
and managing the applicant exercised complete and effective control over his care and movements. So he's legally incapable of consenting to or disagreeing with the proposed action and therefore he's being deprived of his liberty. And what follows on from that is situations in which you need to have legal authority. So Cheshire West in 2014, so that, that was a good few years after that Bournewood decision, this case came to the Supreme, Supreme Court and it provided further clarification of deprivation of liberty because after Bournewood there were still questions being asked and whilst the decision made on Bournewood was held to be applicable to hospitals and care homes it didn't really go beyond that but what Cheshire West did was set if you like what's referred to as the acid test for deprivation of liberty and what that says is that if someone is under continuous supervision and control and not free to leave then that is a deprivation of liberty now what was also said in this judgment is that compliance is irrelevant so in other words whether someone objects or does not object to a move that is irrelevant whether the relatives or anybody else objects or don't object compliance is irrelevant and that takes us right back to section 13 z a of the social work act which if you recall was all about saying if nobody objects then this person can be uh, discharged from hospital even though there isn't legal authority now that is it does sit in contravention to this Supreme Court judgment and it's one of the reasons why there is a need to amend and bring up to date the legislation in Scotland. What was also said in the Cheshire West de uh, decision is that deprivation of liberty applies regardless of setting. So that means that it's not about whether someone is in the hospital, in a care home, in a private home, wherever, that deprivation of liberty is about being under continuous supervision control and not free to leave. If to be subjected to total and effective control and shorn of my freedom to leave would be a deprivation of liberty for me, then why should it not be a deprivation of liberty for someone who lacks capacity? And that's a direct quote from Lady Hale, who handed down this decision. So what Cheshire West did was effectively say there need to be safeguards uh, when someone is going to be deprived of their liberty or in fact is being deprived of their liberty and it had the effect of widening the scope of the number of people who fall under the need for legal authority um, to be brought to bear in terms of where they live. Now in England it's gone quite a different route in terms of safeguards so uh, England has gone through a couple of iterations of uh, legislation, bits of um, policy that support how you authorise someone's deprivation of liberty and that includes what were known as uh, deprivation of liberty safeguards and now is liberty protection safeguards and um, so there's been quite a lot happening there it's still a complex area and it's still a difficult area but it does lead us to in Scotland some of our challenges that still exist around about this so I would say there are two big issues that we have with the legislation in Scotland now you'll note that those two legal decisions in 2004 and 2014 both post date the Adults with Incapacity Act. The Adults with Incapacity Act was laid down in 2000. So deprivation of liberty is not mentioned in the Act. Um, so that's one reason why the legislation needs to be brought up to date. Nonetheless, that legal definition, that deprivation of liberty still applies in Scotland. It still requires legal authority. The other big issue that's coming over the horizon is respecting the rights, will and preference of the individual and making sure that the individual's own will and preferences are followed. 
what that says in the UNCRPD is that there is no best interest concept. Now, best interest isn't a concept that we have in Scotland. The AWI Act is clear about saying that we should be acting in accordance with the person's wishes. But interestingly, in England and Wales, the legislation there does allow people to act in someone's best interest. And that is contrary to that international policy landscape. But also, and importantly, the UNCRPD talks about supported, not substitute decision making. And what that means is that an individual should be supported in every way possible to make their own decision, not have a substitute decision made. Now, a guardian is a substitute decision maker. So indeed is an attorney a substitute decision maker. So there is a bit of a challenge about having anyone appointed. And some nation states are now looking to see what better system can be employed where it's not someone acting uh, for you, not substituting a decision, but where the person is acting as a supporter to support your decision making in the best way possible. So what are the barriers to action? Barriers to action for people putting in a power of attorney. The legislation is little known and it's poorly understood, right? Most of us don't have very much of a brush with the law and we might know laws that are specific to areas of interest to us um, or areas that we have come up against, but generally we probably don't have a, a great knowledge. And I think that is really true of the Adults with Incapacity Act. It has such a massive impact, but it's little known and it's not well understood. Power of attorney is a message about negative life events, isn't it? It's convincing people that there is a problem in the first place and there are myths that go around about that. People think that the next of kin can act for them. They think they're too young. They think I've already got a will. I don't need to worry about that. They forget that a will is for when you're dead. A power of attorney is for when you're still living. Cost is a huge barrier. And I think uh, when we go to Jim Brown after my presentation, Jim will probably touch on some of this a little bit more. Um, but there is a cost to putting a power of attorney in place. There is assistance available with costs, and it's called the Legal Advice and Assistance Fund, but it's quite complicated to get that and you have to go through a lawyer to get it. So that is a real barrier to people don't always feel comfortable consulting with lawyers. And also it means you have to consult with a lawyer, which costs money before you can find out that you're actually entitled to help with the costs of consulting a lawyer. So it's a bit of a barrier to action. So we have an equality challenge here, in my view. We know that more people in affluent areas have a power of attorney, but equally we know that people in the low income category are more likely to require a power of attorney because they're more likely to have the health care issues that might impact on their capacity. So this is a human rights issue, but it has a huge financial barrier. The cost saving potential to the NHS is huge, but it requires funding by each of us individually. So that is a major challenge. And who owns that issue? It is spread among so many different people and organisations. The Office of the Public Guardian that does all the, the registration of powers of attorney administers the system, the Scottish Legal Aid Board, which has the funds, the Scottish Government, which sets the policy, and NHS boards and health and social care partnerships, who in this uh, context really are the ones that stand to, to benefit, aside of course from the people themselves. So to help you to get the message across, well we started a public awareness campaign in Glasgow in 2013. Now I mentioned that conference that we held in Glasgow, um, Anne Cummings from Social Work in Glasgow at that conference wanted to start a public awareness campaign and identified the funds to do it and highlighted to the conference that that was the course of action that was going to be taken. And it's fantastic. That public awareness campaign has now been going since. 
way back then, 2013. It's delivered through a media organisation called Enterprise Screen, and it is now across all health and social care partnerships in Scotland. That's just a slide of the front page of the web page for the campaign, and I would thoroughly recommend that you go through that, go to that. It's your go to place for all things power of attorney in Scotland. And it will really help you both in terms of information advice, and that comes down to a local health and social care partnership level, but also in terms of um, directing people who might want to know more about it. We ran a number of TV campaigns through the awareness um, media campaign through 2013 to 2016. And of course, that has now gone beyond that now and it's still going today. And uh, Anne Cummings is continuing to lead that campaign today. We didn't just focus on TV campaigns back in the day. There we are standing in Buchanan Street selling our wares trying to get the message across that power of attorney is really important. We did a bit of research round about the impact that we had, and we were able to demonstrate that registrations in Glasgow City, which was the hub, the concentration of the media campaign, increased by a third in 2013 to 2014. And that was a bigger increase than was seen in the rest of Scotland. We were able to show that the campaign was responsible for 276 registrations in Glasgow City in the first quarter of 2015, that's 24%. Now, if all 276 of those people that, if you like, because of the campaign, we got to take out a power of attorney, if they all lost capacity and were admitted to hospital, incredibly, the savings made by avoiding delays to their discharge would be in excess of 7 million. But if even just two of those 276 lost capacity and were admitted to hospital, the savings would still cover the cost of the campaign. So we were able to show that running a public awareness campaign is a very cost effective uh, way forward. I'm just going to show you briefly some of the contact from the, the campaign, just for your interest. Oh, I'm great at these. <laughs> We all take a punt from time to time. Some pay off and some don't. But should you really be gambling on your future? Power of attorney helps protect you and your family if you lose capacity and become unable to make your own decisions. Look, I won. Make your power of attorney plans and visit mypowerofattorney.org.uk. Now that was an ad that we showed. That was a summer. Oh wants to play again. Anyway, that was a summer campaign, so it, it was a little bit of a scary uh, thing to do to focus on gambling, but it was in the middle of a summer of sport. So we took a chance and made that link to the fact that people might be um, taking punts on various different sporting events and tried to link that in. We didn't just rely on TV campaigns, but there's a big social media, Facebook, Twitter campaign also. So there were lots of shorter ads that were made um, to, to feed into that. You can get all of these videos and much, much more on the site. But this is just one of the uh, videos that was made for social media. This is Dave. Hi, Dave. Dave doesn't think he needs a power of attorney because he already has a will. Oh, sorry, Dave. A will is only for after you've gone. But power of attorney looks after you while you're still here. It means someone you trust can make financial and healthcare decisions on your behalf in case you were unlucky and became unable to make them for yourself. So, what do you think, Dave? Time to get that power of attorney sorted? Nice one. For more information, visit mypowerofattorney.org.uk. That was one of four similar videos that we made in conjunction with the Office of the Public Guardian, because we went to them and said, what are the big myths? What is it that people think means that they don't need to put an attorney in place? So that was one of those. And I'm going to show you one last video. We can get to move on. 
just because it's coming up to Christmas and this is my very, very favourite. Well, it's a tricky job, you know. There certainly are some occupational hazards. Oh, <laughs> oh for goodness sake. So I like to know that those closest to me can make important decisions on my behalf, just in case something ever went wrong. <laughs> Oh, come on! Somebody get me a cup of chimney! The last Christmas pudding I'll ever have. Always makes me smile, that one. And we actually showed that in Central Station in, in Glasgow up on the big screen. It was fabulous. A final slide from me then, if I can persuade this to move on. There we are. Which is just to talk about your role. So, as health and care professionals, as people with an interest in this area, as people who are supporting other people and also thinking about your own family, your friends, your role is critical in terms of being able to convince people to act. You have some knowledge here and you can convince people of the importance of acting. It is, of course, easier if you can be convinced yourself about the importance of putting your attorney in place. And remember, when loss of capacity applies, the choice is between POA and guardianship, not between POA and do nothing. There has to be legal authority for decision. If you don't give it to somebody, somebody else has to, to, to be stepped in by the courts to do it. And remember, anyone can experience loss of capacity. It's just more predictable when you have a disease such as dementia, but it can happen to all of us. And even if it happens to us temporarily, there needs to be someone who is there for you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you find that interesting and thought provoking. And I guess uh, if you submit your questions using the Q&A, we'll, we'll find out in due course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. And thank you so much, Jill. Um, it's so important that all practitioners are aware of Power of Attorney and the campaign and what they can do to support it. But also as individuals as well, it, it's certainly given me a lot of food for thought as I've, I've listened to it. And with an ageing population, this is going to become a more important issue for the future as well. But as you alluded to, it, it can happen at any age. So it, it's not just about getting older that we need to think about pair of attorney. So, so thank you for that. I would now like to extend a warm welcome to our next speaker of the session. So welcome to Jim Brown. Jim is a development worker with Carers of West Lothian. And Jim is going to tell you today about work that he's involved in to improve the uptake of power of attorney in West Lothian. So Jim, over to you. And as you're speaking, there'll be lots of questions appearing in, in the Q&A box as well. And just to reassure everyone that we will be picking up um, the questions at the end of the session, both for Jill and Jim. So over to you, Jim. Unmute always helps. Um, thanks very much, Michelle. And yeah, I would just like to talk to you today about um, the work that we do and have done over the last few years in, in West Lothian. Um, trying to move my slide on, sorry. To go back, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, as you will see, a bit of background was I started with Carers of West Lothian in 2006, uh, purely as a um, carer support worker. And at that time, we supported and still do support carers of uh, people with any health condition. Um, but Probably as time went on, I discovered that we were um, supporting more and more people that were looking after somebody with a diagnosis of uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And I did say to our chief executive at the time 
that um, I thought if we ever got the chance to have funding to do a specific dementia support worker, um, we should. Um, and uh, that chance came along in 2010, I believe it was. Um, we got care information strategy money and I was appointed a development worker to try and work along with um, the NHS and social work uh, to support people that were looking after someone um, with a diagnosis. Um, as you'll see there, the projection in West Oden at the time, uh, back in 2008, 2009, is that we were going to have an increase in West Lothian uh, of a 150 percent increase in people over 75. And obviously we knew that that was going to bring a lot more people into contact with us who were looking after somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, and that's how it actually um, that's how it actually happened. Um, to start off with, I was working across in the hospital um, in the uh, with all the old age psychiatry, and we made an arrangement with the the um, the senior uh, consultant there that we could sit in on in the the West Park Day Hospital where there were. Um, people were coming in to sit their tests or sit their examinations and get their ACE tests and also have their diagnosis all on the same day at that time. And uh, we were allowed to sit with the um, the carers whilst the, the patient was in being uh, being given their, their, uh, their diagnosis. Um, and we offered office to support the carers um, as, uh, as long as they um, were quite happy for us to be in contact with them and offer them ongoing support once a diagnosis had been given. Um, the post diagnostic team at that time was a very small organisation. They only had two or three people in it and they were doing their best as far as power of attorney was concerned. They were downloading and completing power of attorney uh, pro formas from the Office of the Public Guardian's website. Um, but we thought we could come up with a, a better way of, um, of delivering that service and helping them out. Um, slides not moving on. There we go. Um, Sorry, that's went on one too many again, sorry. So the post diagnostic team started working with carers of West Lothian, refer carers for ongoing support to instigate the discussions around POE. Um, to this date and for the last 10 to 12 years, the, the post diagnostic team have referred 150 um, families to ourselves um, for ongoing support and obviously to, to talk about power of attorney. Um, and to um, and to see them through the the trials and tribulations of being a carer with this condition, we had previously worked with um, a firm of solicitors called Morrison's, who um, had provided um, legal information at uh, dementia specific training courses to carers who were who were interested in finding out more information about the the condition and how. The professionals in the NHS would deal with their loved ones while they were in that system. So we also had um, parent care transition courses that the same solicitors came along to provide information on power of attorney, guardianship orders, wills and trust funds. So we contacted them and they offered to put together a power of attorney clinic, which we started in 2012. Um, and that was a means of carers coming to the carer centre and um, given an instruction for per attorney to be done. We were able to see 12 people every month. Um, and even recently during the, the lockdown period, we carried that service on um, virtually by Zoom appointments and by Microsoft team appointments. Um, unfortunately, that caused a little delay because we were only able to do eight or nine appointments on a day um, and we found that um, the demand for the appointments was such that we were booking two or three months in advance. So it became um, quite important that the 
solicitors, um, as I say, currently black address solicitors uh, are who we work with. We're very flexible about maybe fitting in an extra day each month um, and, and taking more appointments to stop the, the build up for people in terms of uh, being two or three months down the line. Um, it, it has worked well and we are now back to doing face to face appointments. It's all really about um, get an early referral though, because we can only offer appointments to carers that we know. Um, and this is where the this is where you come in and this is where the, the social work teams come in um, that we want a referral from yourselves as quick as possible and we will try and put a power of attorney appointment in place. Um, to that point, back in 2008, we had a, a hospital worker, Keith, one of my ex-colleagues who no longer works with us, but he did a, a very good job in, in St John's Hospital as a hospital support worker. And um, fortunately, when he left, I was able to um, almost jump on the bandwagon and, and take advantage of the good contacts he made. Um, to the extent that, uh, as I said there, we were invited to um, attend uh, MDT meetings for most of the um, most of the medical wards in the hospital, which meant we got early access to, to carers. We were able to identify um, carers who might be in a stressful situation, carers who might need the chance to get a power of attorney in place. Um, and to this day, well, prior to prior to COVID, we were going there every week. Um, sorry, I've got a block in my screen here. I don't know if anybody else has got that. Um, Oh, it's moved, sorry. Yeah, um, sorry about that. Um, the, the work we do in the hospital at the moment, going to the MDT meetings, um, highlights the fact that um, better overall support for carers to manage their role can mean a difference between someone um, being admission to hospital or the family being a better able to, um, to maintain their care and role and an admission always isn't possible. So it's a proactive role could mean the difference between a patient becoming a delayed discharge or or moved on to a destination that's been agreed. Um, so really the earlier we get a referral and are able to support that family, um, the easier it can be for the patient to move through the, the whole process in the hospital um, and provide um, provide support to that family for us. Um, I would say please use your local community, your local care centre. We won't be the only ones who have a power of attorney system up and working. Um, it's um, we're there to try and help and we're trying to, to get to people at the earliest possible uh, opportunity. So please make a referral as quick as you can to the local care centre and hopefully we can continue to provide the power of attorney service that will um, enable families to, to get better control and better support. Thank you very much for that. Apologies for the technical problems. Thank you, Jim. So thank you so much, Jim, and what a lovely example of integrated working and, and making the most of what carer centres can offer. And I'm sure you, you and your team provide invaluable support to people at that time. We've um, a more detailed case study on Jim's work that's been finalised and we'll share that with you um, along with the slides um, when it's ready. And um, thank you again, Jim, for, for a great presentation. So there has been a whole raft of questions in the Q&A box and, and Lynn and Julie have been doing an amazing job trying to filter through all of them and theme some of them. So we now have the next wee while for, for Julie and Lynn to pose the questions to our panel, which is Jim, Jill and Vivek. So over to you, Lynn. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you so much, Jill and Jim. That was so interesting and I'm, I'm sure people have learned lots. 
Um, there's a couple of questions. I'm trying to theme them. I'm, I'm also trying to see the most popular, but there seems to be a couple of questions around themed around and um, can any medical staff assess capacity or are there specific criteria around who is allowed to do that? And there's another one, Vivek, I'm wondering if these are maybe um, for you. There's a one from a GP who said um, who can do capacity assessment around housing issues. I don't know if you saw them, Vivek. I don't know if you want to pick those ones up. Um, I mean, there are some restrictions about who can assess the capacity. So, you know, within the legislation, it's a registered medical practitioner, dental practitioner, ophthalmic uh, optician, and uh, uh, then we have got another category called registered nurse, but the nurses have to go through a, a specific training to assess the capacity. So this is actually causing, causing a blockage in terms of the, you know, how many folk can assess the capacity. Uh, so at the moment, you know, these are the only professionals who are uh, you know, uh, 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 authorized to assess the capacity for medical treatment and capacity. Uh, so the other question, I mean, I saw the question. It's slightly, I think it's uh, very specific. I think, I mean, if the question was something along the line, you know, if the person, I think the question is something along the line, can the GP assess the capacity for, you know, signing tenancy agreement or going into tenancy? But generally the questions are more like, you know, can the person move from nursing home to live back in their own home? And do they understand the implication of you know, having to manage all the issues? So that's probably will fall between the medical others, but you know, if you think you know this, uh, I mean, it, you know, I don't know the specific answer to that particular legal question. I mean, you know, if you feel you're not confident, I mean, you know, sometimes we can ask uh, for an independent sort of uh, capacity from uh, outside. But uh, I, I suppose if it is, if it covers some welfare areas, uh, then. Probably there might be a role for the GPs so that you know uh, we can avoid uh, future hospital admission because of the social issues, you know, uh, ending up with the medical issues. Thanks, Vivek. Julie, have you got a question for the panel? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's been loads of comments in there around um, costs, the costs of power of attorney, and I think that was the highest voted question that was put in the the, the Q and A function. Um, but Tracy Reid's asking, can you explain potential costs? involved and if there are exemptions or sources of financial support clients can access to make this process easier. I know, I know you referred to some of this, Jill, but I wonder if Jim maybe want, wants to say a wee bit about the costs um, from your initiative, Jim. What does it cost and what's your kind of experience of, of the different costs that people can be charged? Yeah, it certainly can. The um, the average cost in, in West Lothian tends to be between three and six hundred pound. Um, Black Harder solicitors who provide the service for us charge 197, and that is basically um, 95 pound plus VAT for the solicitors' fees and 83 pound for the Office of the Public Guardian's registration fee. So it is a, a good bit of a saving. And I know Jill spoke about various um, schemes where that there are possible help with with that. We we took the we took the decision to to offer the the carers the choice of a straight reduced um, cost. Um, and they plumped for that. That's what they wanted because they going through the the um, legal aid way was kind of get quite complicated and quite stressful for them. And they decided to they would prefer to pay the 197. Um, so it's still considerably cheaper than uh, what they would pay elsewhere in West Lothian. Thanks, Jim. Jill, have you got anything you want to add to that about the costs? Sure, Julie, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, J Jim's already alluded to the fact that it's complicated to go the route of getting your costs paid, and that is one of the real frustrations because Scottish Legal Aid Board does administer this Legal Advice and Assistance Fund, which can be applied to if you are an older person, retired, getting certain benefits, then eligibility should be really straightforward because in a sense your eligibility has already been checked because you're receiving the benefits. So it shouldn't be such a complicated process, but it is. And the problem is you have to go to a lawyer. And as I said in my presentation, that is a barrier to people actually approaching a lawyer. Now, some of us, particularly if you've bought your own home, you might be quite you know, reasonably OK with going to consult a lawyer. But for many people, 
that feels like not something that they would do or they might not even know anybody who's ever done that or if they have it might be in a, a bit more of a tricky or negative situation so it is a barrier and you have to do that that's how you access that fund there is also a, an ability to get the office of the public guardian to waive the fee um, the Office of the Public Guardian is a great source of advice and support. So people could also approach the OPG direct and say, what are the circumstances? How, how could I go about getting, getting costs? Your solicitor, if you're using one, should know about that too. Thanks very much, Jill. Back to you, Lynn. Thanks, Julie. Um, really interesting question here that, that got lots of likes. I am aware that a power of attorney needs to act as if. However, if the person has not always made decisions that are you know, not of, of their best interest, um, so perhaps not promoted their own health, not taking their medication, um, and then you know what what happens in in, in those sorts of such uh, situations? Is there further action required? And also, if someone has stated that they do not want to go into a care home, however, now their safety is significantly compromised by staying in the community, are power of attorney able to overrule this? Can I take that first? Sure, Jill. Yeah. Lynn and Vivek might, might well want to come in on this too. Um, I, again, it is a complicated area, but I think you have to bear in mind that we are all of us responsible for ourselves and we are allowed to make bad decisions. So if I decide, if I have high blood pressure and I decide not to take uh, blood pressure medication, then that is my right to do that and nobody else has the right to make that decision unless, of course, I lack the capacity to make that decision. And that then becomes a different story. However, if you have laid it out clearly that you, that is your wish and you don't want to do it, then your power of attorney, your attorney should not override your wishes. And if it comes to something more difficult, like you are um, being considered for admission to a care home because you're not safe to be at home, even though that isn't your expressed wish, then if the attorney is going against your expressed wishes, then really that should go uh, to a court to make that decision. So it is possible, even though you have an attorney in place, that you could end up getting legal authority from a court. Yeah, I think just to sort of add to Jill's uh, comment, I think. Uh, so I think I was looking at the document, and uh, so for the power of attorney, uh, you know, you, you can't use the power of attorney if it involves significant restrictions on the liberty of the person. So if it goes to that step, uh, you would need to look for a guardianship order, or you know, if the the situation merits a mental health act assessment, you'd be looking at you know depriving somebody's liberty and taking their freedom away through those legislations rather than power of attorney. It's the same sort of question, I think, you know, somebody goes to care home, they're staying there with the power of attorney uh, powers, they're not asking to leave, they're easily persuadable, uh, you know, then you can use that uh, power of attorney. But if they start to you know, consistently express their wish that they don't want to stay there, then we start to wear into the, the area of, you know, needing uh, uh, other powers such as guardianship. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panel. I'm just aware of the time. Um, is it back over to you, Michelle? Thank you, Lynn, and thank you so much um, to, to everyone. That's all the time we have for, for questions, unfortunately. If there are many more burning questions that we haven't answered in today's session, then we'll endeavour to pick these up afterwards and we'll address them in the Q&A link, which you will have access to. We hope you find the brief session useful. Um, we've also compiled a list of useful resources, which, um, which we hope you, you'll find helpful um, to further your knowledge on and around this subject. I'll just move my slide on to the resources. And as we come to the end of the webinar, we'd be really grateful if you could just spend a few minutes um, of your time um, to let us know what you thought of it and just link, click on the link in the Q&A box, which will appear um, for a very brief evaluation. Thank you for joining us today and I'll leave you with some information on what else is coming up. Um, so you can look out for what's being advertised um, over the next wee while. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panel 
for um, their contributions to today, to, to Jill, to Jim, to Vivek, and also for the really powerful presentations that we've heard in the session today. And I'd like to thank all of you for, for all of your contributions and, and for joining us in, in the session. And I know it's a, a very busy time out there for you. So, so thank you for taking um, some time out of your busy schedule to be with us. These are the, the webinars that are appearing on the screen that we have coming up over the next few while. So we hope to see you at one of our future sessions. And in the Q&A box is the evaluation. So we always want to learn from, from our sessions and we want to um, see what was useful for you from the session today. So thank you for taking the time to complete our evaluation and for joining us today. Thank you. And Merry Christmas, everyone. Hope you enjoy the festivities over, over the, the festive season. Nice to see you all.